This week, Trinity Flock is delighted to launch our panel discussion on women in sport. This event will examine the legal and policy changes necessary to further gender equality in sport and to bring about a cultural shift in our perception of female athletes. We're joined by an incredible lineup of speakers, including Kleena Guy, she's the Head of Licensing, Legal and Compliance of the Irish Horse Racing Regulatory Board. We're also joined by Sarah Colgan, she's the co-founder of Along Came a Spider and the 20 by 90 campaign. We'll be joined by Ruth Fahey, she's a former WNL soccer player, a current pundit and a William Fry trainee solicitor. We're also joined by Louise Riley, she's a barrister at law specialising in sports law mediation and arbitration dispute resolution. And finally we'll be joined by Florence Williams, she's founder of the Perception Agency and a Wasps Ladies Rugby football player. We really hope that you enjoy this event and we would like to sincerely thank all of our guests for participating. Hi, my name is Cleana Guy. I'm Head of Licensing, Legal and Compliance with the Irish Horse Racing Regulatory Board. And I'd like to thank the Trinity Free Legal Advice Centre for inviting me to take part in this Women in Sport webinar. Um, just what I'm here today to talk about is my career in sport and some of the areas that possibly don't get uh, much attention or acknowledgement in sport industry because it's the behind the scenes work that goes on on a regular basis to ensure that sport at both the grassroots and professional level can proceed. Um, I'm a qualified solicitor. I qualified in Ireland in 2009 and I have been working in sport for the majority of my career. How I've got into sport, um, I'm unusually enough, I'm not a big sports fan. Um, I um, have been involved in sport for a number of years as my family were involved in athletics. And I had the opportunity to work at some uh, international athletic events, the European Championships and others abroad. And I had got a huge interest in what goes on behind sport um, to and federations and everything to allow sports to go ahead or to ensure they move on. Um, after or subsequent to that, when I was about 19, I became a doping control officer for Sport Ireland. And I did that for about 10 years uh, taking samples from athletes, um, urine samples, so you don't require a medical degree, thankfully, um, and was involved in that, which is a whole other area, it's, which is very interesting and helped to grow my interest in sports management, sports administration. When I qualified as a solicitor in, in 2009, I worked for a short period in private practice, and then I joined the FAI as a disciplinary manager in 2010. I moved up to legal manager and I left the FAI in early 2014 and moved to Switzerland uh, to start work with the International Boxing Association in Lausanne, near the Olympic Boxing Association. I worked there and I had the opportunity to go to Rio for the Olympics and I finished up with Boxing Association in the end of 2016, beginning of 2017, moved back to Ireland and took up my current role which with what was then the Turf Club and has since become the Irish Horse Racing Regulatory Board. Um, my role in the organisation is varied and quite broad. I work on legal matters as they arise, so insurance claims, litigation claims, um, GDPR, which is uh, the new, or not the new, uh, bane of our lives, but something that uh, takes up a huge amount of work. I also work on the compliance side and disciplinary. So with um, any issues arising from the racetrack or from our licensees and dealing with the enforcement of the rules of racing. And I also work with the licensees. So I'm responsible for the department to deal with the issuing of licenses to participants. So jockeys, trainers, that kind of area. So it's quite a broad, varied role. In terms of... The women's sports line, I know you're having another uh, speaker who will deal with 2020 and the campaign there. If you, she can't see it, she can't be it. And that's something that has gone a huge, done huge work in relation to increasing the profile of women's sport, but not just women's sport. It's also the involvement of women in other areas of sport. So it's very important that we increase the number of girls and women involved in playing and participating in sport, but also on the other side of it. So we have women involved or female referees in football who are very high profile have done well not high profile but have gone to a very high level within the sport and in other areas but it's not always seen or recognized in terms of um what is known outside of the sporting world and as well as that we have a large number of women in ireland and internationally involved in sports federations however that isn't always visible 
So I think part of the issue is what the roles and the areas involved and the people involved in sports federations isn't always clear to people outside of sports. So we are effectively a normal company. You have finance team, you have IT, you sometimes have legal, you have administrative side, so high performance as well, uh, logistics, you know, teams and um, gear, kit, everything. Don't get to events without having a team of people who actually organize that, make sure you get on the right flights, make sure you have the holiday, the, the hotels booked, make sure you have the equipment arriving at the same time. Even then in some sports, making sure you have food there that is specifically purchased and controlled for the athletes. And that's a whole area. And it goes from national federations, uh, well, clubs, the leagues, national federations, right up to the international federations. And a lot of the large federations, you have people involved in media rights, people involved in communications, marketing, event management, the whole area that federations need and deal in. And depending on the size of the federation and the financial wherewithal of it, it depends how many people you have. Often you have uh, one or two people filling a number of roles uh, compared to what you might have in a normal commercial organization. But these roles aren't always seen. And even if you ask athletes, coaches, anybody involved in the sport, they don't always know what goes on within the federations to ensure that the sport can go on and to develop the sport. And most sports would have development officers whose responsibility is to go out and work with participants and encourage and increase uh, participation across the sport, which is very important. You know, we don't have a sport if we don't have people who are involved and working within it and who want to participate, as well as those who want to view it. So increasingly important in times has become the media rights and ensuring you have the audience who want to engage with you, as well as you see sports federations and clubs, individuals, everything who are on various aspects of social media, because in terms of increasing their brand, they then have the interest from sponsors and other people who can help them participate and can help them achieve their goals within their sport. But a recognition of those areas and an understanding that those roles exist in sports is extremely important so that we can achieve a balance between male and female, people who are, have participated in the sport themselves, maybe to an amateur, maybe to a more professional level, and those people who haven't, who come from different areas and bring different skill sets. Um, I personally never participated in sport as part from school. I wasn't someone who was hugely involved in any type of organized or unorganized sport. However, I bring a skill set from outside of that area in terms of my legal training and an understanding of how sports work from my family background. And that, in, in my view, um, is beneficial to the sport. It allows me to be involved to ask questions to see things and sometimes come with a different view or uh, learn from the people involved uh, my, my views aren't always right so it's very important that we have a debate we have a discussion and we move forward in terms of encouraging women to get involved it's important that women put themselves forward for election especially in the volunteer organizations or recognize the roles that exist within sport um, it's a very demanding industry. It doesn't work nine to five, Monday to Friday, as most sports events are on the weekend or on the evenings. Um, if you're involved in an international sport or a sport that's involved in the Olympics or had world championships, that can bring with it its own demands in terms of travel, in terms of um, involvement and work uh, load that's caused by that but it can also be extremely fulfilling and very interesting when you go to these events and see how they actually operate what happens um, it's a lot different being on the inside and being involved as opposed to being a spectator or watching it on tv um, and it can be extremely interesting to see that uh, Looking at how to encourage women and get them involved, especially at the higher levels in terms of board involvement. I'm not someone who would have been pro-quota, I believe, or I had the view that quotas almost encourage the view of tokenism, you know, that you have women or individuals from other minorities involved just to tick a box. However, 
it's been interesting. I've had a debate recently with uh, friends of mine who are pointing out that you have to start somewhere. And while quotas might not be perfect, are they not better than doing nothing? And it's an argument to be looked, looked into. Um, there are a number of extremely well qualified or uh, not qualification in terms of academic or anything like that, but women who have the experience, have the ability to give a huge amount to a sports federation, to an organization, but for whatever reason, don't put themselves forward. Maybe they don't believe they're the time. Maybe they don't believe they're the skill set. Uh, maybe they're not interested and that's fair enough. But to encourage those people to do so and also to encourage those involved in the sport to seek them out. Um, quotas may achieve that uh, where others have failed. Now we've seen with the Me Too movement and changes in kind of society perception of corporate governance and how things should work, which applies to sport bodies as well. Sports, while it might be an idealized area, is not something that is immune from all the issues that we have in society generally. But these are but a lot of governments, a lot of sporting bodies are recognizing that and also applying the structures and the corporate governance aspects that are existing in commercial worlds to their their organizations, which it's positive. It moves things along. Change takes time, but we are moving and we are getting there. But with the requirement to ensure diversity, to ensure that boards have a balance of individuals who may not represent the historical attitude, may not be all male, may not be all white, may not be all English speaking, whatever that combination is, depending on your country, depending on your organization, depending on your sport, but have something reflective of the diversity that exists in sports at a grassroots and at a professional level. That is bringing a balance. It's bringing a difference in views. It's bringing a understanding that you need to have the policies and structures in place to ensure that athletes and anybody who's participating in the sport can do so in a safe manner, can enjoy the sport and have that security within it that they are protected. And we've seen, unfortunately, the number of reports of cases of documentaries that exist showing where sport has failed as have other organizations, have other industries, but sport has failed to protect those involved. And only by us recognizing that and seeing where we can do better, can we improve? Is that, you know, quotas? Is that requiring um, athlete representation on boards? I think all of it is a positive attitude, but we have to have that balance. We have to have inclusion of all areas of the sport of society that are involved in that sport and reflective of what exists. You also have the people who aren't involved in the sport. You need people who are external, who can ask those questions and pose the queries that maybe if you were involved, if you've been brought up in a sport, you don't ask because you expect or you accept it as being part of your industry, of your federation, of your sport. And you see that like uh, one thing you get told often I'm not told often, but you hear in sport is custom and practice. And you hear this in all industries, but it, I've been told custom and practice. And when you ask kind of, well, who's custom and what practice, they don't have the answer because it's something that has existed and it has been accepted for a period of time. And it's only when you break it down and start looking into it and maybe it is the right custom, maybe it is the proper practice, but it's always worth having someone ask those questions and being in a position to ask that question. So, only by having people in organizations who can challenge the norm, who can ask the questions and who will challenge the norm, be them directly involved, grown up in the sport, participated all the time, or someone who's come from a different area, but has that willingness and ability to challenge, can we progress? Can we move on? And can we become better? So I think it is happening. Um, I think change is coming along, but it needs support. And we also need women to stand up and be counted and to become involved and to take on those voluntary roles and to take on the professional roles and see where those roles exist. I think that's extremely important. Um, hopefully I haven't exceeded my time too much. And um, thanks again to 
Trinity Flack for inviting me and hopefully some of what I said was interesting and informative. Thank you. Hello, my name is Louise Riley. I'm a barrister and I specialise in the areas of sports law and international arbitration. My experience with sports law goes back over 10 years when I joined the Court of Arbitration for Sport in Lausanne, Switzerland, first as counsel and then as managing counsel. And during the five years I spent at the CAS, I handled over 400 arbitrations, so sports disputes relating to a wide variety of, of issues, including doping, so athletes who are taking performance enhancing drugs, qualification disputes, governance disputes, match fixing cases, and then many football related disputes, so contractual disputes essentially between football players and clubs over things like transfer and um, payments related to, to, to the transfer of the players. Since returning to Ireland and taking up my practice again at the bar, my area of practice and my source of work, if you like, has come predominantly from sports law, specifically the issue of athletes taking performance enhancing drugs, or in other words, doping. And I invariably am engaged by international sports bodies, so federations and organizations who pursue athletes for anti-doping rule violations. Now, the case I'd like to speak to in the few minutes with which I'm going to address you today is not a doping case. So this is not a case do it, dealing with an athlete taking performance enhancing drugs. It's a very interesting case that raises issues of gender identity, sexual identity, human rights, an athlete's right to privacy, and a real balancing of the rights of an individual to self-identify and the rights of a group in terms of how that group is identified and how that group competes within itself. And the case I, I want to refer to is that of Casta Semenya. For those of you who follow athletics, you will no doubt be familiar with this case and with this athlete. She is a South African two-time Olympic gold medalist in the 800 meters. And for most, if not all, of her adult athletic career, she's been under a cloud and been subjected to various tests, investigations, international media that would be, I think, difficult for anybody to tolerate, but particularly for a young girl and woman as she was at the time. So just to give a little bit of background context, Castor Semenya at the age of 18 won the World Championships in the 800 meters. Instead, however, of being led to the podium, she was brought to one side and subjected to a sex verification test. Um, the way in which that was handled, I think, is acknowledged by everybody, including World Athletics at the time. It wasn't handled very well. The details that she underwent the sex verification test were leaked to the press. And as you can imagine, that was a level of scrutiny and attention that nobody wants to be under. In the intervening 10 years, World Athletics, which is the international governing body for the sport of athletics, was trying to find a way to deal with athletes who fit into a category in which Casta Semenya fits, and that is, she's an intersex cisgender woman. So she was assigned female at birth. However, she has XY chromosomes and naturally elevated testosterone levels. Now, for those of you who, again, who follow sport, or have an interest in sport or indeed biology, will realize that having elevated levels of testosterone and in Casta Semenya's case, she, her level of testosterone was in the male range it has been long um, expected, if you like, but in fact, it has not proven that having, a, for a woman to have a level of testosterone in the male range gives her an unfair advantage over female competitors. So the question was how to regulate this. And the question which World Athletics faced was, how do you regulate something which is naturally occurring? There is, there, there is no question of Castor Semenya taking testosterone to enhance her performance. She naturally had this occurring by virtue of the fact that she has a condition known as the difference in sex, in sex development, which means that she has, as I said, XY chromosomes and a high level of testosterone. So World Athletics spent many years going back and forth on this question as to how to regulate, how to maintain a level playing field for athletes who are female, who identify as female, but that category of athletes 
who who have this difference of sex development. So what the, the regulations that World Athletics, World Athletics came out with were to require women with high testosterone who have this difference in sex development to take medication in order to lower their level of testosterone. So for those athletes with the DSD um, who wanted to compete in competitions between 400 meters and a mile, they had to take medication to lower their natural level of testosterone. This regulation, if you, if you like, impacted directly on Casta Semenya, who was one such woman. The rules were challenged by Semenya before the Court of Arbitration for Sport. And when I say it's a complex case, it is, as I said, I handled over 400 cases while I was working with the CAS. It's probably one of the most complex cases that I've seen before the CAS. Um, and just to mention, I wasn't involved in the case, so I speak just based on, on knowledge that is available in the public domain in the award, which has been published. And it's a very interesting read for anybody who wants to look further into this. The award was drafted by Annabelle Bennett, a former judge of the Australian High Court. And it's a very thoughtful award, which, which really grapples with these complex issues, these complex questions. And the award says very early in it that Casta Semenya is a woman and she's recognized in law as a woman. And while children manifest similar athletic ability pre-puberty, this changes to significantly post-puberty. The award goes on to say that sex is not binary for all purposes. And what World Athletics regulations were trying to do is that it's an attempt to be an effective and legally defensible means of reconciling the binary male-female classification in competitive athletics with the variegated spectrum of biological sex char characteristics that exist in nature and the increasingly complex and diverse national laws governing legal sex. And as I'm sure you can all agree with, the labels male and female have different meanings in different contexts. So for example, they may refer to a person's legal sex, that is their sex in the eyes of the law, their subjective gender identity, how they identify themselves, or some specific aspect of their individual, individual physiology, such as their gonadic characteristics or their hormonal profile. However, the sport of athletics is divided in a binary fashion you have events that are male or female. So the sport of athletics, and I suppose, again, looking at from the sport administration point of view, it's easy to see why this is the case, that it's, it would be very difficult for sport to try and recognize the, the, the different meanings and different contexts of, of sex or legal sex. So they look at male and female. And World Athletics refer to male sports sex, that is, athletes who identify as female but are biologically male, have test days, and high levels of testosterone. So the CAS panel focused on what they were really looking at was whether women, such as Casta Semenya, with this condition, which is a 46XY difference in sex development, have an athletic advantage over other female athletes, and if so, whether the magnitude of that advantage is capable of subverting fair competition in certain athletic events. And by majority, so two out of three panel members accepted that female athletes with this condition, with this 46 XY difference in sex development, have high levels of circulation testosterone in the male range, and that this does result in significantly enhanced sport performance ability. For example, the effect of having this increased level of testosterone increases muscle mass size and the levels of circulating hemoglobin. And again, the CAS panel looked at the fact that natural human biology does not map perfectly onto legal status and gender identity. The imperfect alignment between nature, law and identity is what gives rise to the conundrum at the heart of this case. So, Again, it's an award, it's, it's quite a long award, but it, it's worth reading in terms of looking at how the panel really tried to look at this in a very holistic, broad view. And looking at that, trying to, to, to marry that, if you like, with the, the approach that World Athletics, similar to all other sport takes in terms of dividing sex in a binary fashion, that you have male sport and you have female sport and male categories and female categories. 
And in conclusion, the CAS held that the regulations were necessary, reasonable and proportionate to ensure fair competition at women's sport. Casta Semenya was not happy with this outcome, so essentially the outcome meant that if she wanted to race, if she or any other female athlete with this 46 XY difference in sex development wanted to race in any competition of between 400 metres and a mile, she would have to take testosterone to lower the level of testosterone in her body. She unsuccessfully challenged the CAS award before the Swiss Supreme Court. So the Swiss, the Swiss Supreme Court upheld the CAS award that these regulations were necessary, reasonable and proportionate. And after following the, the, the CAS award, Semenya is quoted as saying, excluding female athletes or endangering our health solely because of our natural abilities puts world athletics on the wrong side of history. I will continue to fight for the human rights of female athletes, both on the track and off the track, until we can all run free the way we were born. And in response to the, to the Swiss Supreme Court decision, World Athletics is quoted as saying, World Athletics has always maintained that its regulations are lawful and legitimate, and that they represent a fair, necessary, and proportionate means of ensuring the rights of all female athletes to participate on fair and equal terms. World Athletics has rejected the suggestion that they infringe, that the regulations infringe any athlete's human rights, including the right to dignity and the right to bodily integrity. So this very brief exposition, if you like, of, of that case is just to, to highlight um, a case that raises very complex issues. As I said, there's the, the competing interest of the private individual or the individual athlete to compete how she or he or she is, how she is, is naturally born versus the, the rights of the group to compete on a level playing field and also other rights such as the right to bodily, bodily integrity that if these athletes with, those, with that chromosomal irregularity want to compete, they have to take testosterone to, to lower the natural level of testosterone. There is some commentary that Casta Semenya might appeal the decision of the Swiss Supreme Court to the European Court of Human Rights. So that's a development that may happen. Um, it has also been quoted in certain newspapers that she has joined a soccer team. So she's going to, to switch sport to soccer. And mo most recently, I read a report that she's going to drop her discipline or drop the distance of her discipline to 200 meters, which would take her outside the regulations, which only impact athletes competing from 400 meters to one mile. So that's a very brief look at what I think is one of the most interesting cases to come out of the Court of Arbitration for Sport in the last decade. It's a story that will continue to raise issues, debate, discussion. Um, it's certainly not over now, but it's, it's one to, to keep an eye on. So thank you very much. And thank you to Flack Trinity for inviting me to be part of this series. Hey, I'm Floyd Williams. And I run the Perception Agency, which is a marketing agency specialising in women's sport and trying to change the perception of women's sport for the better. Uh, so a few weeks ago, I wrote a tweet that caused a little bit of a stir in Ireland and um, around the world, which led to the hashtag Enough campaign. Now, what happened was the Irish rugby jersey was launched and they used the male players in the jersey, which was great. And they launched a women's jersey at the same time and they used some female models to launch the women's jersey. Now, I found this quite disappointing, which I uh, relayed in my tweet, which I captioned, spot the difference why the male rugby players who had earned their place were used in that jersey, and instead for the women's jersey, they used a model. This tweet got 4,000 likes, 1,000 retweets, led to one Sky Sports interview, one Telegraph interview, an official pol apology from Canterbury, the kit provider, one brand policy change, and a global internal brand discussion on women in sport. Now, unfortunately, situations like this aren't isolated incidences. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a background as to why I felt so strongly about this particular campaign and why I felt that it picked up so much media interest and so many people around the world agreed with it. Um, so being a rugby player myself, I can speak from experience of um, turning up to rugby age seven or eight, you're the only girl there. I couldn't see another woman on that field unless they were a mum, including coaches, including staff, including physios. Um, I watched men play rugby on TV. 
I watched my local team tra- playing rugby on a Saturday, all of which were men. I went to the shops when I needed new boots and I went to the boys section. I had to, when I ordered rugby kit, it was men's kit. I was told it was men's kit. That's where it was labelled on the shop. When I watched men on TV, it was always a man playing and there were always male, male commentators and men talking about the game at half time. When I was asked what I wanted to be when I grew up, even though I had international rugby aspirations, I needed to think of a career because that wasn't a career path for me. Whereas a 16-year-old boy would have said, I'm going to be a rugby player. And they would have had absolutely no doubt in their minds that that could have been what they wanted to be when they grew up. I then, as I went to university and continued to play rugby, I had to balance my study, my rugby, my work experience, my home life, all around rugby because I wasn't given the time to recover, to train and do everything I needed to do to be the best at my sport. I still had a degree to do. I still needed a job. I still needed to pay rent. And you still have to balance all of those things around it because ultimately the respect you get as a female rugby player is uncomparable to what you would get as a male rugby player. When there are games on TV, sometimes the game is a little bit dull, but they don't blame that on the gender because there's so much interesting media and build up and fancy graphics around the game, it kind of hides the fact that sometimes the games can be a bit boring. Whereas a women's game, if it's a bit dull, immediately it's dull because it's a woman playing it, not because, oh, maybe they had an off game or maybe tactically it wasn't the right decision, which is what the excuses the men would get. It seems to be gender is the first reason as to why something isn't executed right. It must be because it's a, it's a women's game. It just seems to be an excuse that people pull out quite easily. Um, so it's quite difficult growing up in a world like this and being surrounded by this male sport culture that when you see something like a, a rugby jersey come out, which is actually the women's jersey, which some people have grown up, spent 10, 15 years working so hard to represent and to wear and to wear that jersey with pride for their country, that they can't even use a female player to model it, it kind of emulated that entire journey that I've just spoken about in one piece. That's the the respect that the rugby community gives to the women's sport. And um, and like I say, it's it's not an isolated incident. There's so many cases in which women's sport is given a tiny portion of the pie or the respect is minimal or the pay gaps for example the funding it's it's just it's a huge landslide towards the men and I understand that the men's game brings in more money but as you can see from the age of six years old you're led to feel like this is not really an option for you um and it is because of this journey that I've experienced is why I'm so passionate in forging a new one for anybody else who is starting rugby or a fan of rugby who isn't going to be able to compete at the most elite level like the men that I don't want them to have to go through this always feeling second class not even getting the absolute bare minimum of respect in the media and unfortunately you have to make waves and you have to say what you mean. And sometimes you have to be a little bit controversial to get people to listen because unfortunately keeping quiet doesn't lead to change. Um, And on that, the three key areas that I believe change needs to come in which would, which would end up in forging this new path for women's sport. are So one of the key areas I would say is role models. So if they had used a, a female athlete in that Jersey, that could have given an audience a role model, someone to look up to. Someone's wearing that jersey with pride. You can't expect to have the same 10, 15 men at the head of a union um, on the board for the last five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years and then expect them to suddenly change. You need that wholesale change at the top, which can filter down. You need people from different industries, different experiences, different walks of life on board memberships so that they can truly represent their sport because sport is diverse and it's going to change with time. And unfortunately, there's too many cases of the old guard who are still at the top of their unions and they're not keeping up and 
sport is falling behind. But if sport is a business and you need to run it like a business and you need to keep up with the trends, you need to keep up with your fan bases and your audiences and you can't just, oh, it's always been them, so we're always going to have them. I appreciate you've got to take note of history, but we're not living in it. Times are changing. Um, so, yeah, my, my three key areas to hopefully change the future of sport and the brands around it um, are role models, can't see, can't be, commercial growth and leadership. Um, this industry can sometimes feel a bit like you're bashing your head against a brick wall and no one's listening or it's never going to change, especially when you read comments on Twitter. I would not recommend it because there are some ignorant people out there who just, apparently if you're um, born with a penis, it just gives you the right to presume that no woman should ever be playing sport. But anyway, um, so when I feel a little bit like that, I just have that thought of um, that little girl who was starting rugby all those years ago who felt like maybe this is a bit of a man's world, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. And lucky for me, I was brought up in a way to think you can be who you want to be. But thinking of all those girls who maybe didn't want to do it because it's a man's world and they didn't feel comfortable and they didn't feel that they have a pathway, they didn't have anyone to look up to. And I just remind myself, this is why you keep fighting because you want to change it. And hopefully we're in the best position that we've ever been for women's sport. And next year we'll even be even better and the year after we'll be even better and the year after that will be even better. So keep pushing because if there's going to be a time for change and progress, now's the time. Hello and good afternoon slash evening. My name is Ruth Fahi. I am currently a William Fry trainee and a member of the William Fry Sports Group. And it is my absolute honor to be a part of this presentation today. In addition to working in law, I am also an avid sports fan or sports fanatic, essentially. Uh, my primary love has always been football or soccer. I've played football for the majority of my lifetime and I've also had the privilege of working in football broadcasting in recent years. So a little bit of reporting, um, but mostly working as an analyst or also as a co-commentator. So weirdly enough, I am much more accustomed and conditioned to standing in front of a live broadcast as opposed to recording myself on screen. So please bear with me if I do stutter through this presentation at times. Um, but again, it's an absolute honor and a very much privilege to be part of the presentation today. What I am going to discuss today in brief is a topic that has become quite popular in sports law debate and discussion lately, and that is of equal pay. And just for the very particular purpose of this presentation, keeping it short and sweet, I'm going to focus on equal pay in international football and just give a quick synopsis of where it's come in recent years, um, along with some inevitable sidebar commentary from myself, and also give an indication of where it may go in the future. So in brief, equal pay became a real concept in Europe, in the world, I suppose, in international football in December 2017, when Norway became the first federation to introduce equal pay between their male and female players. Um, this would have come off the back of a very successful Euro 2017 tournament. Now by successful, I don't mean for the Norwegian team. I think they actually had their worst tournament ever, coming placing last in their qualifying group. Um, didn't get out of the group stage at all. But successful tournament in terms of the exposure, publication, popularity, standard of play of the tournament. Uh, it re received quite positive coverage all around. Europe and indirectly around the world as well. Um, so Norway took the plunge, introduced equal pay for the two international teams. The president of the Norwegian uh, Players Federation cited the high player profiles as one of the uh, concrete reasons why they're able to actually bring this scheme into a reality. And women's football fans will be fam familiar with the likes of Ada Hegerberg who was a first female Ballon d'Or winner in 2018. Um, funny enough, actually doesn't play for her, for her international side. She actually boycotted the team uh, just before the equal pay came in as a result of 
poor treatment or what she perceives as poor treatment of the Norwegian domestically and hasn't since come back, but hopefully we'll see her back in the very near future. Next team to reach a milestone was inevitably the mighty USA. It was announced in March 2019, so just in the lead up to the Women's World Cup that year, that the USA female players had brought a suit against the USSF, the United States Soccer Federation, um, and what they claimed was a violation of the Equal Pay Act and also gender discrimination under the Civil Rights Act. Um, so in the cloud of these proceedings, they went on to compete in the Women's World Cup and as we all know, defended their title successfully in a ridiculous campaign. Um, if anyone watched the Women's World Cup, you would have seen them in action. Pressure doesn't seem to affect <laughs> international American players, or rather, well, international female women's players, um, but rather makes them perform better. And I was fortunate enough to be working at that final in Leon. I was co-commentating. I'll never forget the moment after the final whistle went and the chance of equal pay reverberated around the stadium. It was kind of one of those special moments in sport that you don't forget. Still have my memorabilia here. This is the clip, the front page, the day after the final. That's Meg Rapino celebrating her penalty that she scored against the Dutch. Um, it was an incredible tournament and I feel very fortunate to have witnessed the US and have been seen live in full flight. It was actually, uh, the, sorry, the decision was handed down in May of 2020 of this year that they were ultimately unsuccessful in their claim against the USSF. Um, reason being that they had entered into their collective bargaining agreement agreeing upon the terms uh, willfully. So they'd negotiated in the years previous to, to the proceedings um, and there was nothing really the judge could do but abide by those terms. And they did announce that they would appeal that decision and I'm sure we'll hear more about that going forward. Next up in the milestone timeline was the Australians. In November 2019, um, this was actually a really interesting equal pay deal announced. There's quite a lot of commentary on it. There was quite a lot of publications detailing the process of reaching the agreement, how it was done and what it meant for Australian football. And it's, I would recommend if anyone has interest in the topic to go and read around it because uh, it really reflected quite well on both the Australian Federation and the, players, the Australian Players Federation as well. And one really lovely quote um, that came out of the equal pay agreement was the following. I'll just read it out briefly. A governing body's social license must be scrutinized closely to ensure it is achieving not only its sporting and economic objectives, but discharging its social obligations to Australians, which now clearly involves appropriately valuing the role of women in sport. I thought it was a really nice quote because one of the important distinctions to remember in the equal pay argument is that you're dealing with a international football and then on the other side is club football where you're looking at purely a profitable body seeking commercial objectives. Um, it doesn't have the same mission statements as a governing body would have. So when you look at international football and governing bodies' mission statements, you see where it's like foster, develop, promote the game, develop a football culture, strengthen social harmony, and evoke a sporting spirit. Um, it's just a really good point to keep in mind when, when considering why or why not uh, equal pay is a reality in certain federations. Um, but that was the Australian's big moment. Um, they implemented a four-year collective bargaining agreement where they'll essentially get the same access to off-field benefits, um, the same access to the life specialist performance staff, and really importantly, they'll receive an equal share of the total Bayer-generated revenue, which is pretty incredible. Next up on the announcement list was the English women's team, where it was actually announced recently that they have been receiving equal pay in terms of remuneration and bonuses since January 2020. This was unsurprising to, uh, for me. I actually thought they would have been closer to that stage. Um, I suppose they would have had it in place previously because and doing fantastic work in women's football development. Uh, again, those fans who are following women's football will see where the WSL is going this year, the Women's Super League. There's been huge signings 
huge signings abroad, the likes of Alex Morgan, Tobin Heath, Christian Press in the US, Rosa Velsan Youth, had to put our own Denise Sullivan in there. Um, and they've all joined the WSL and what that means is the American public will now have access and the fan base has been extended which means money is coming in so it's no surprise that the English women's team has implemented this scheme. It's for remuneration bonuses only. There's then the question, there's a whole other question then of uh, tournament prize money um, which would have huge knock-on effects to the international size if that was increased for another day. Most recently in the equal pay milestone announcement was Brazilian women's national team which I was really pleased to read about earlier this month. If those who were watching coverage of the World Cup religiously like I was would have remembered uh, Marta's declaration, her plea for equality at some stage throughout the, the, the knockout stages. So Brazil have huge players in the women's game, Marta, Dabinia, Formiga, Christiane, and there's so much history and culture behind their team. So seeing the likes of Brazil, who would have historically been very behind in terms of equality, bring in equal pay is uh, just a huge positive to reflect upon. And it was absolutely brilliant news. A quick comment on our own Irish women. We will all remember the infamous strike that occurred in April 2017, where um, the Irish women's team essentially aired publicly their grievances. Um, it resulted ultimately in a confidential settlement, which we are not privy to the terms of their conditions and pay per matches and per camps has certainly increased and become formalized um, in terms of the disparity with the men's side. It's still, the rift is absolutely huge. I think the women's team receive about 12% of what the men's do per match, per competitive match appearance. So certainly still more work to be done, but it has come a long way. It certainly has come a long way. Um, I'm coming to the end <laughs> of my, my little time section so far. Hopefully that was somewhat entertaining and interesting for any women's football fans out there or uh, sports law in general. Just a quick overview of where Equal Pay has come and some commentary on why it's come there and hopefully a bit of a prediction that it's going to continue to go this way. There's no way federations are going to roll back on standards that they set and I'm sure a lot more federations will come on board to Equal Pay over the next five years or so. Certainly uh, a lot has been done and a lot more work to do. Thank you. And again, thank you for having me today.